my first question is how important research is to you? Mm. Well, very, obviously, and I think, um, partly I think that research to me is about ideas, always, and um, so I so would put the caveat there, there's that all research to me is a small R rather than a big R. So I don't think when I'm writing an article that that's the only thing that research is, and I don't think that when I'm teaching there's a separation. So for me, if I was only doing teaching, I would be researching my teaching, because for me the thing about being in university is always about trying to understand how things work, how to do things differently, and how to make things better. Um, so it wouldn't matter if I was a postman, <laughs> you know, doing the rounds, I would be trying to think about that. So I think by instinct I'm a, a researcher, uh, with a small r, and really for me that's always about ideas, um, looking at the ways in which ideas are applied to reality, and then thinking about the ways in which they might be better. Mm. And it just so happens that I'm also a researcher. Mm. So I, I guess I think research, and this kind of who I am, really. And you um, special, specialise in applied theatre, theatre yeah. research? Yeah. Can you say just a little bit about what you do there and what, yeah. how that inspires you? Yeah, so applied theatre, a very simple way of, of saying it is that it's theatre outside of a theatre and theatre in social contexts. And the reason I got involved with that was that I trained in Northern Ireland during the trail end, tail end of the Troubles. And uh, I was doing a theatre degree and trying to connect what I was doing in theatre, which seemed very separate to what was happening politically there. Um, when I graduated, I really wanted to try and work out how to relate theatre to the world around me. And so we started working with um, cross-community groups, so that's uh, groups of Catholics and Protestants, and uh, did drama work with them. And initially I really wanted to do lots of issue-based work, so I'd be talking about the politics of the situation, and I'd be looking at the ways to explore social issues or tensions that might exist between the two groups. Um, but pretty soon the, the kind of teenagers turned around to me and said, well, can't we just do some drama? <laughs> <laughs> And really from then on I realised that the, the connection between theatre and, um, and people's issues and difficulties uh, was a complex one, and so not to take it in very superficial, issue-based ways, but really to use the full range of um, theatre and aesthetic processes to explore really what it means to be human. And that really has been the main thing that I've explored in different contexts. So working in war zones or conflict zones, uh, working in prisons, currently working with uh, people with dementia, um, people with returning soldiers. So for me, each of these contexts asks and demands me to respond in a slightly different aesthetic way. And it really comes from the needs of the context and the needs of the people that I'm working with. And for me, that's just the eternal challenge of what I do and the eternal curiosity of what I do. It strikes me that research in applied theatre is a bit different from most other research in education. Mm. So how important in your research is actually publishing and how, how important are other aspects of the research process? Because you've got all this great work going on with all these kind of, what would you call them, some of them traumatised mm. groups and groups that are you know, real strongly social, socially oriented work. So is there anything you can say about the specifics or the, 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 the specific characteristics of work in applied theatre? Yeah, I think it, it's kind of a unique position because you're also a practitioner and a researcher and therefore personally I find it quite hard to research something that I haven't practised in. So therefore, I guess the analogy is more like a scientist who works in a lab for 10 years before he publishes anything. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can look at the literature and you look at other, what other people are doing and kind of extrapolate from that particular approaches. But for me, the nitty gritty of theory exists in the practice. And you can take those ideas that are already out there and then walk into a room and explore the ways in which that theory does or doesn't work with that particular group. So to me, the, there's a long gestation, I guess, in, in terms of grounded research, where you have to be in the place really to understand it and to know it, and um, to really live the, the problems that those people in that context are going through, to understand how theatre does or doesn't kind of 
fit with their worlds and their lives. And for me, that's the eternal question. I think I would be frustrated if I was only a practitioner, because for me, there, there's an instinct to practice and an instinct to understand the ways in which it works. But going back to my original uh, thought, which is really about problematizing everything. So every time I go into a, a practicing, and even if it goes well, I'm thinking, well, why did it go well? How would it be different if this other group were there? And um, so there's a really strong need in applied theatre not just to be good at the practice or to be experimental in the practice, but also to be able to articulate some of the messiness and the difficulties that you encounter in those situations and not to shy away from um, those kinds of issues. And uh, for me that's as interesting a problem as the practice is in trying to articulate all the things that happen in a gesture or in a moment or when someone cries or when someone laughs in response to a particular exercise. Um, so there's, there's a move towards um, impact in era and so on. It sounds to me like uh, your work and working with applied theatre here will benefit from that in a sense. Yeah, I think so. And I think it fits kind of rather accidentally but fairly neatly into that whole rhetoric of, of having impact with your research. Um, and for me, it, it's a primary interest in the research. I, I would feel probably quite uncomfortable as a researcher if I was only sitting in my study writing up abstract theories. Um, I'm someone who wants to live in the world and I want to experience the world and I want to try and understand the world better through practice. And therefore, um, the notion of impact, which I don't necessarily think is a good term, but I think interaction is probably a better term or, or uh, um, something that is a, a social benefit. Um, is a very positive way to look at research. So for me, I'm pretty natural with that process and that uh, concept. And, but I can understand why theoreticians or historians might feel a bit nervous about the all-encompassing concept of impact. But uh, for me, the impact is twofold. One is the actual practice, and then the research, which I think makes the practice better. Now, most staff in our school are on a 40-40-20 workload profile and that means they have to balance their research with teaching and service. How have you managed to organise your time for research considering the other demands that are made on you as a busy academic? Uh, I don't think there's a perfect format and there's times and periods in my life when my research has disappeared and there's times in which it's uh, you know been at the sort of forefront of my time schedule and I think um, what I have got better at is uh, really having a very clear idea of what I want to do with the research. And so I'm a fanatic on timetabling, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I timetable my time as effectively as I can, and that includes an annual timetable in terms of goals of what, how many articles I want to do, or which research projects I want to do, or uh, which grants I'm going to go for. So I have a pretty clear idea when I look at the year, at the beginning of January, how each month kind of breaks down. So I have an annual uh, report, and I've also got a monthly kind of timetable target as well, and then a weekly one, and then a daily one. And the, the weekly and the daily one are more interactive and responsive to things that come up, um, so issues that might uh, appear on the horizon, or a student that needs to see me, and you will know, spend more time with me. And so it kind of fluctuates a little bit, and is a bit more dynamic. But certainly like the annual and the monthly ones are pretty hard set. Um, and it's very, I've learned it's very important to have that timetable and I think it's very important to also stick to that timetable. Um, someone once said to me, you know, if you schedule a, a three hour research block um, that you make sure that you stick to that block. So two things, if, you, if you've got a teaching and you're teaching in a class for three hours, you wouldn't expect to be answering emails at the same time. Neither would you expect telephone calls from colleagues or administrators. So to me, the research you know, block is as important as the teaching block. And I think once you actually put that down and close the door, and whatever happens when the door is closed, it happens. But uh, it's very important to create those blocks. Um, and for me, there's sort of certain personal strategies. So for example, I'm a morning person, and all my ideas come good in the morning. And uh, I'll close the door at 8 o'clock and it won't open until 11. Um, and the big trick for me is 
uh, sitting down with a notebook and, and writing out what I want to do in that morning. And then also definitely, definitely not opening my emails. Because I think as soon as you glance your emails, suddenly you're going, oh, and I've got to contact Mary. Oh, and I've got to talk to that student. Oh, I'll just respond to this. And suddenly the morning is gone. So my golden rule is always if I've got a research block, if it's half an hour or an hour or three hours, I, I don't turn on the email and I, I turn off my phone. And that's my block of time. Do you have any tips for our researchers, especially our ECRs and other emerging researchers, to ensure that they find time for research? Uh, I do think blocks of time are very good, and as I say, sort of creating a timetable. Now that's, I think, harder than it sounds, because I think what happens is that can easily get corrupted um, quickly. Um, but what I tend to do is, uh, I actually say that I will do some research every day, and that might be half an hour, or it might be an hour, or it might be a three hour block. And then I also block out a particular period of time when I'm writing up an article or I've got some data to analyse or I might allocate uh, a week or two weeks generally over summer or in the holidays. But I think the big mistake is to say I'm going to get my research done in the summer and just rely on the summer uh, to break the back of all your research or say I'm only going to research um, in holiday periods or, or in particular or even on particular days because I think everyone knows that okay Friday is my research day you get to Friday and you're so full of the week and competing agendas and deadlines which are sort of 12 o'clock on Friday that unless you're incredibly disciplined it becomes very difficult so I think if you put aside some hours a day uh, and it can be, as I say, half hour or an hour or three hours, depending on your time allocation. And those are, again, kind of blocks of time which you absolutely protect. And I also think one of the big things for me is also people think of research as writing an article, whereas I actually think there are, the, the notion of research can be much broader than that. So it's reading. So if I've got a half hour research block, it could be reading a journal article. And if I read five articles in a week, in a busy teaching week, then that's a pretty good achievement at the end of the day. Um, and uh, it can also be the copy proofing or editing material. And again, I can do that in half an hour or a 45 minute block. So for me, it's about breaking down the different research tasks and not necessarily thinking three hour block equates to I must write so many words. So there's a whole range of, I think, research um, tasks which need to be done in order to do grant applications or project manage or do articles. So it's about breaking those, those kind of tasks down. So for example, if I'm writing an article, I tend to put aside about a month to write an article. The first week will be reading, conceptual ideas, planning. Uh, second week will be jotting down a structure, getting some headings down, looking at where the literature needs to come in. And then the third week is often the time when I might block out some time and do some uh, concentrated writing. So I'll block out two days and just write for those two days. And then beyond that just becomes about refining the edit, um, showing it to people to get their feedback, and uh, kind of letting the, the article evolve and get refined and edited that way. So for me, it's about breaking down that process. What role does effective planning of your projects play in your research? What few are the issues in planning that you pay particular attention to? Okay. Uh, I think we're like one of the things I've learned in the last sort of six or seven years is is uh, when you get a research grant, for example, how time consuming they are in ways that you can't actually imagine. So um, a lot of my work is applied, so I'm working in a very particular context where there's a lot of um, relationship management between you and the partner organization or the uh, group. There's also a lot of relationship management with the research team. So at the moment I've got four ARCs and each team is very different in the way that they function and very different in the ways in which um, uh, the project is operating and working with. And as the lead CI, I'm kind of responsible for all elements of that and what I hadn't quite anticipated in uh, research projects is just how much time project management absorbs. Um, and the second link to that is just how much data is produced as a result of research projects and how detailed that then that becomes in terms of making sense of that data. Um, so when you're actually putting these research grants it all sounds really clear that you've got first year 
setting up your ethics, setting up the relationship, second year data collection, third year data analysis. And that sounds really neat, but actually it's kind of like trying to do a PhD in three years. It, it's never going to happen. And so, uh, and for me, research grants are PhDs times five in terms of their complexity. So I think for me, understanding the project management uh, process um, has made me become much more organized but also I think has challenged me in the ways in which I manage things um, and the different ways in which I have to uh, manage things and I think has made me a, a more uh, uh, appreciative of, of how different individuals and researchers work um, so for example some researchers just want to be left alone to do their own thing and uh, are given a task and they'll go off and do that and they'll use the data accordingly. Other people need a lot more time together to work on things together and want to be more collaborative. Uh, other people there's there's lots of problems in terms of the paradigms that they come from and the negotiation between research methods. So for me those are incredibly rich discussions because they inform and change the way in which I think about research but they're also incredibly time consuming as well. So learning how to manage that on top of everything else um, has become something that has made me much, much more organized, I think, and much more conscious of the ways in which um, I need to delegate as well within projects. Now for you, Michael, research is clearly largely a collaborative activity, but for many researchers, it could be a lonely activity. So. How important would you say it is for emerging researchers to build up collaborations to get away from that lonely researcher yeah. position? Mm. I think there are different kinds of collaboration. And I think, um, it, although for me, research is also actually quite an active thing and a collaborative thing because I'm working in applied contexts. And so the silence of my study when I'm writing up something is somewhat of a luxury because uh, most of the research I do involves people and involves working in, with the research team or working closely with a particular community. So I actually relish the, uh, the analysis of video or the analysis of data and writing that up and, and then working collaboratively with other researchers to um, make sense of all that. So for me, it's not so much a, a lonely thing, it's actually finding the time to get lonely. Um, and the other issue I think is, particularly for early career researchers, is pick your teams carefully. I think they uh, sometimes teams that you want to have a particular name on the grant or something because it will help you get the grant, uh, but they're not necessarily going to be the most useful in terms of the development of the project. So find out who you enjoy working with and who sparks ideas and who you generate interest out of projects and you've got a genuine shared passion for a subject because I think that carries a lot. Um, so for example, uh, like I, I'm doing two projects with someone who sits in a related field but, but in some ways outside of my territory but who's an incredibly generous collaborator and is very generous in terms of her ideas and her concepts it's not afraid to challenge me in terms of my assumptions and that is a really really rich relationship and finding that though what I've discovered is actually quite unique uh, because quite a lot of time either people take a back seat or tend to work in isolation um, or tend to work in less um, fulsome collaborative mode so I really enjoy those relationships because they challenge me and they make me learn and they question the things that I do which I do think is important are you want to add something? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I think um, that one of the things I think that academia is excellent at, by and large, is that it's, it tends to be quite a collaborative environment where people are generous with their ideas and generous with their time, um, almost to default is in terms of um, sharing ideas or contributing um, uh, questions to, to the processes of, of the research. Um, and in a way that's antithetical to business where everything's very competitive and where sharing idea can be a real problem. So certainly for me in my career I've benefited from collaboration at pretty much every stage um, and benefited from relationships where I've gone to people and gone, I don't understand this, can you help me do this? 
and people have been incredibly generous with um, supporting that and questioning it and critiquing it and making my projects better, often in a way that doesn't do them credit or they didn't need to spend that time with me. So I do think collaboration in general terms in academia is, is a wonderful gift um, and therefore I think early career researchers should not be backward in approaching people in the field or people who they don't think they should approach and asking for advice and asking for support. Uh, because for me that's been one of the, the key learning areas is, is learning from people who know more about things than I do and can advise me. So what advice would you give to young or emerging researchers about research career planning? Um, one, have a plan and two, really kind of try and stick to it and make the plan work. I think uh, having been an academic for about 20 years, it was it only became clear to me that I needed a plan <laughs> when I was about five or six years beyond my PhD. And I think academia isn't very good at articulating pathways uh, in careers. It kind of, I wasn't very sure about how you would become a senior lecturer or how you became a professor. It seemed like a almost kind of masonite kind of process when I was an academic. So, and, and also I didn't ask those questions. And it, so for me, it, it's uh, been trying to find out uh, what those processes involved. Um, but to be honest, I never really, I'm not a careerist. Um, I've always done things which I've been passionate about. And uh, certainly in the last 10 or 15 years, academia has made it clear about what kinds of things that you should be doing as a researcher. Um, so, for example, applying for research grants or uh, publishing, all those kinds of things. If an academic doesn't know that that's what they should be doing, then, you know, they should do. Um, and, but for me, those things are, are things that help me to achieve the things that I want to achieve, rather than things that I think are important to do as a career. Uh, I think if uh, it was the other way around, I probably wouldn't be in academia. Uh, I do the things that I want to do because I'm passionate about them and I want to do them and uh, they're very important to me. So getting a research grant is, is fantastic because it enables me to have the time and the energy and sometimes the resources to explore that in a, a very meaningful way. So for me it's not a bind to put a research grant in, um, there's a technique to it, um, but uh, to me it's something that can be learnt and that can be done and you just have to set your mind to it. Would you like to comment on the publication process. I'm thinking particularly of being persistent and resilient in the face of work being rejected by reviewers and editors. Has this happened to all of us? Yeah. I think two things. One is about your attitude to the, the criticisms and the knockbacks that you get. Um, I think generally in the review peer review process, my experience is, is that 95% of the feedback is um, constructive and 5% of it is, is someone with uh, a bad Friday afternoon <laughs> uh, case. So for me, and my attitude always is, uh, you know, how do I make this uh, article better or how do I make this book better? And the feedback is a, a process for me for doing that. And uh, by and large, uh, the feedback that I've got uh, in the fullness of time uh, has been good and useful and has made whatever work I've been doing better. So I think if you go in with that attitude, then I think that's a whole lot more positive than getting up to you about the kinds of responses that you get. And of course, no one wants to get rejected, uh, but I think it's important, you know, that, that you can reflect on the article and what the people are saying about it. And it may not be about the actual quality of the article, maybe that, maybe that you've misread what the journal wants or is looking for. So that is as much about, for a researcher, is about understanding the needs of a particular journal and writing for a particular audience. So for me, I write for five or six different kinds of journals, and I know them pretty intimately in terms of the kinds of material that they're interested in, uh, where I can push the boat out a little bit with them, um, and where, really, if I sent them an article, it wouldn't be the right one, and I'd expect them to criticise it heavily for it not really to fit in the framework of them. I think the other thing is having done quite a lot of peer review stuff, I think uh, quite a lot of the time the pressure to publish often results in people handing in material which isn't quite there, so it would be 75% there or 80% there. And for me as a reviewer, 
I go into that process in the same way like I would with a PhD. I want to make the article better. So I'm not particularly someone who's destructive and constructive. I'll pick up on the technical details, but I will drill down into any kind of conceptual issues because uh, I think that's my job, you know, as a peer reviewer, is to try and uh, make the weak points better and to make the overall article sing a lot better. So that's my responsibility as a peer reviewer. The other thing is I think um, I think there are preventative measures that researchers can take and sometimes that's really about timing um, because I think most of the, the poor articles I've read have been rushed. It's a bit like a bad student essay. You can tell the ones that have been done in the last two days and the ones that are you know just struggling with the kind of concepts. So for me I have a pretty clear process so three or four weeks to write, quite a lot of technical revisions, I show it to three or four people that I respect, I get their feedback, I send it out to a copy editor and so by the time I've actually sent it out I'm pretty confident that um, I've got a good sense of whether or not it's ready to send into the journal and if I get comments back it really only adds um, to the feedback and generally um, I, I make changes but there are only three or four changes to make because it's gone through already uh, quite a high scrutiny um, through my own kind of internal processes and for me that is really important because again I want to make the, the best article I can and I want to write it in the best way I can and as a writer you do need that feedback you do need someone to to criticize it to pull it apart to go this I don't understand that and um, and so it's a very you know, important process. Though. Is there anything you could say to a colleague who's lost momentum in their research? How could they become research active again? I think two things, and I think uh, one, I think it, there, is a, there needs to be a desire to re-engage with research. I think it's one of these things that it's about trying to reignite a, a passion that once was and having got lost, um, really making a, a, a kind of a real clear sense with yourself that you're determined to do something about it. Um, and I've had people you know, come and talk to me about ideas or uh, things like that, and uh, if they're not determined to enact that or determined to re-engage with it, then I think it, no one else can do that for you. So I don't think I can rescue a researcher who doesn't want to do it for themselves. It's a bit like kind of it's a poor analogy, but it's a recovering alcoholic. You know, if they don't want to, you know, come to the table and actually engage in it, then for me, all I can is to suggest things to them. But certainly, having been in those sort of situations myself in the past, I do think it is about because you know, in a long career, you do get down times when you get lost, or you feel like you're repeating yourself, or you feel like you've done it all before, and it's easier just to do the same things that you've done before. For me, that's a lot about taking stock and um, and really taking a step back and thinking about what is it that, that I'm intrigued about and where is my curiosity flaring up. And again, in some ways it's easy for me because, it, because of applied research. It's not something that I never feel curious about. So if I have a meeting in Logan with a group working with refugees, that, that's a privilege to me to be invited into that group and uh, my curiosity can never switch off or I hope it would never switch off because if it does then I become a cynic and I think then I need to hang, hang up my books and become an administrator <laughs> but, but you know for me you know research is, is a deep deep passion and I think sometimes you, you do get go a bit dry with it but, but to me the interaction with people is something that is compelling and if I'm sitting there talking to someone or meeting someone or they're talking to me about their story, then I can't switch the curiosity off. It, it becomes something about uh, an interest about how I connect that theatre to, to their lives again. Um, and so it really goes back to when I first started about the relationship of what I'm passionate about, which is theatre, and the ways in which I can make that relevant to contemporary contexts. So for me, those contexts are always alive. Um, they're never ending. The, the, the dynamics and the problems and the issues that exist in those things are never going away. And it, all I can ever do is make a very small contribution to that. But I'm, it's very difficult not to be passionate, and it's very difficult not to be engaged in those, the, 
those areas. Um, but it can be overwhelming, um, which is, is the other form of burnout. And, uh, and that's a case of no matter what I do, the research isn't worth it or doesn't have a value or its value is so minor that uh, it's not meaningful. And those are, I suppose, are the darker aspects of it, and that's potentially where a demotivation can arise for me. But having said that, those are only the, the kind of dark Thursday afternoons when I'm struggling with a problem that I can't see a solution to. And for me, one of the ways around that is, is the, the notion of collaboration, and that's really where the true value of collaboration comes, because you're struggling with it, often people, other people are struggling with the same problems, and, but they will have a different energy and will see that problem in a slightly different light. So for me that's the time when if you're lonely it's time to reconnect with your research colleagues or a mentor or an informal mentor. Um, I think the other thing that's been very important for me, not so much about when I've been demotivated, but has been um, informal mentorship within um, academia. And I can think of at least two people who weren't in my field, weren't connected with the department I'm working in, but who I've gone off for a cup of coffee with and shared some stories with and they've suggested things and talked to me. I just had that sort of informal um, conversation and they probably don't know it, but they, they have added a lot and made me re-engage or made me rethink about a problem in a slightly different way. And so for me, that is one of the real, again, when I, when I go back to that, that culture within our academia, which is that ability to, to, to go, hey, can you come for a coffee? I, I need to talk through something. And for someone to spend 15, 20 minutes doing that, and that is a perpetual source of re-energizing, um, reimagining uh, problems. Um, so for me, the, the thing is reach out, uh, get talking to people, uh, chuck some ideas around, and really from that, I think, uh, you know, sparks will fly if you have the will to pursue them. So is there anything else you'd like to add? I think, uh, I think the main thing, particularly for early career researchers, is to, to be bold and to have a vision of what it is that you want to do, uh, to collaborate with people that you enjoy working with, um, but also to get organised and to really take responsibility for your own timetable and to really think through how you divide up the various pressures that you will have on you because ultimately actually no one's going to do that for you. I think the strength and weakness of academia is that it's highly autonomous so you do have a timetable to teach classes and for assessments and for administration and meetings and things like that but actually it is, it, there's a high level of autonomy and sometimes that can be a freedom uh, for you to go create and research and be highly productive but other times that can easily get swamped by all the other pressures and sometimes those pressures become internalized and I think the, um, the, the continual guilt that you have about I should be doing my research one of the strategies that your internal demons do is, is put the other priorities ahead of that research. And so I do think it's important that people take responsibility for those internal demons and are able to switch off those um, priorities. Not that they go away, but you have to quieten them down a little bit so that you can concentrate on the research. Because I do think research needs focus and I do think research needs independence and I do think research needs silence and I do think research needs time aside from uh, everything that's going on around you and so it's uh, beholden to all researchers to create that space and time. Thanks very much.